via telephone. Mike Pushkin he is the state Democratic Party chair and a delegate out of Canal County as well. Mike, good morning, sir. How are you? Uh, good morning. I'm doing well. Did you just say it's your birthday? No, two weeks ago was my birthday. I was supposed to be born on this day, but I came out two weeks early. Well, you're a go-getter. You wanted to get out there and get out the world. Right? <laughs> uh, my birthday was last week. Oh, happy uh, birthday. Uh, not, uh, thank you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Let's just have a mutual happy birthday society right here during okay. the show. That's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Good way to start the show. I'm calling from the uh, what I call the uh, bad idea factory. I'm here in the... Uh, in the bowels of the bad idea factory, which is otherwise known as your state capital. <laughs> That's where I'm calling from today. Appreciate that. Hey, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. We'll first start with the, the biggest uh, monster in Charleston right now, that being the tax cut bill. Uh, this is something that I guess the House finally has at least now a document from the Senate to begin to work out some type of compromise bill. Mike, what are your thoughts on what the Senate has sent forward and your thoughts on what the House might do with it? Um, well, okay. I, what the, well, I thought what the Senate sent over is a bit convoluted. Uh, I, I feel that the voters spoke loud and clear uh, in, when they um, uh, defeated Amendment 2. Uh, I believe this is an end around on uh, the will of the voters uh, in giving these rebates mainly for, uh, for, for heavy equipment. That's mainly going to benefit uh, out-of-state corporations. Um, I think we have a separate resolution. The Democrats in the House have introduced a separate resolution to do it the right way uh, if you're going to do a a reduction of property tax, to do it the right way and put it back to the voters just for the car tax. I believe that would pass. I think it would pass overwhelmingly. But Amendment 2 didn't pass. So I think this is uh, really it's it's, uh, just ignoring the will of the voters. Um, Now, the House tax plan is more along the line of what the governor proposed, which is a 50 percent um, income tax cut, you know, for everybody. What the Democrats in the House, and I know there's just a few of us, but I think our ideas are better, and it needs to be said. Our plan is we're going to have a meaningful tax cut. Let's make it meaningful for the people who could really use it. And ours is what we propose is 100% income tax cut for those making uh, 80,000 and below, for you know, middle income earners to give them some meaningful tax relief, not a 15% cut or a 50% cut, but a 100% cut. That's what the Democrats are proposing, and that's what we support. When we had Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr on the program recently, he said the state can't afford the governor and the House's 50% tax cut for the personal income tax. And he took it out, I think, till the end of the 2020s and showed a giant cliff of a, of a revenue drop that would put the state in a precarious situation financially. Obviously, the House does not agree with Senator Tarr's finance numbers and projections going out five years, six years. Do you think the state can afford a 50% personal income tax cut, Mike? Well, I mean, there's a whole lot of ifs there. If it, if it attracts more people in, like they say it will, I, I am not convinced of that. I don't think a 50% tax cut is really, uh, on just state income tax, is really meaningful enough to, to do what, what they plan on it to do. Oh, it was interesting that the governor chose uh, to bring in Grover Norquist yesterday. That was. Uh, who, uh, yeah, and then they had their little uh, round table, which looked more like a dog and pony show. Uh, no offense to Baby Dog, of course, over at the Culture Center. Hey, uh, but, yeah, Mike, were there, any, were there any Democrats Grover invited Norquist to that? was at the helm. Uh, we were all invited. I went in for a little bit. We, we were invited not okay. to participate in the roundtable, but to sit in the audience like any other member of the public. But uh, you know, Grover Norquist was, I believe, the one who was behind Governor Brownbeck's uh, uh, tax plan, if you want to call it that, in Kansas, and see what that did for Kansas. Uh, they eventually had to lay off uh, police officers. They had to lay off firefighters. They eventually they closed schools. They laid off teachers. They defaulted on loans. And eventually, they did what uh, no lawmaker, especially a Republican lawmaker, wants to do. They had to go back in and raise taxes to correct their mistake. And that was the uh, brilliance of Grover Norquist. And that's who uh, the governor brought in to to, uh, show off yesterday over at the Culture Center. In regards to some of the bills that are currently happening with DHHR, is there a solution there that you like that's being discussed? Well, you know, I, I voted for the uh, the bill to reorganize the DHHR. I think if we break it down into smaller departments, that makes it more manageable. But unless we really fix the 
cultural problems there, then instead of just having one dysfunctional department, you have two or three dysfunctional departments. We have major staffing shortages. We have to uh, address that. We have to, uh, you know, give meaningful raises so uh, the people are attracted to the public sector. And, you know, we can't compete with, with Walmart and McDonald's if we're not even paying people that well. Then of course, we're going to have staffing shortages. Um, but I also think we need to look at some of the root causes of the problems uh, that are you know, addressed by the DHHR, whether it's our foster care crisis, uh, whether it's the amount of, 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 of folks in, in, in different programs that, that need help. We need to start looking at some of these root causes or we're constantly just going to be putting you know, Band-Aids on, on bullet wounds. Um, we have some plans to deal with that, and I hope they, they listen to them. I'm told from our uh, comment section on Facebook, by the way, uh, one of our listeners uh, slash viewers mentioned that the House will have public hearings on campus carry tomorrow. Mike, and I saw last, last night in the news, of course, Michigan State University, the latest site for a mass shooting on a college campus. This, of course, was not a student, as the, the news is telling us. It was somebody from off campus. I've got a mm-hmm. nephew who goes to school at Michigan State University. Mm-hmm. Obviously, uh, this hit home closer than most of these do uh, for me. But your thoughts on a campus carry uh, law? I, you know, I, I'm not on the committee that it's in. I've not seen the, the, what, the current state of the bill. In the past, I've always opposed campus carry. I think that our universities should be able to make their own rules uh, regarding firearms. I know how I was when I was a freshman on a college campus. And uh, I wasn't the most responsible person in the world. Uh, I, I just I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's what the legislature should be focusing on. I think we have a lot of real issues uh, that we need to address in this state. Uh, I, I can go through a whole litany. I already talked about the foster care crisis. Uh, we need to find a permanent funding stream for PEIA. We have hospitals now that aren't taking PEIA, aren't taking our public employees' insurance. Uh, we have a whole litany of problems, and to focus on on, on these types of bills, uh, especially in light of what happened last night. And I just, you know, I'm just now learning about this tragedy, and this, you know, my heart goes out to those who who lost their lives and their families. And you know, you send your kid off to school, you expect them to be reasonably safe. And I, I don't think that uh, I think most people uh, think that uh, campus carry is just a ridiculous policy and it's not something that it's not something i'm hearing a public outcry for that's for sure you mentioned the peia and the hospital situation the governor was in martinsburg a couple of weeks ago and this was brought up in one of the complaints that one of the members of the audience had and he said that's been corrected that's no longer an issue is that a fact mike is has it been corrected if you, if you call just putting one-time money into a, a an ongoing program correcting it then maybe but that's not correcting it uh, we've been saying all along, you have to fund it. And that means a designating a permanent funding stream for it. Uh, you have a couple options there. You do that, or on what I would not uh, be in favor of, you'd have to, uh, you know, raise the uh, uh, premiums on our public employees. You know, people go to work in the public sector, and they, they don't their their pay's not on level a lot with the private sector. But for years, we said, you know, but the benefits are good. It, it equals out. Well, it's no longer equaling out. We have to take care of those who, who you know, take care of us, who go into, into public service. So I don't believe it's fixing it. I think we need to find a, like I said, a permanent funding stream in order to keep it solvent. Um, and that way we can raise the reimbursement rates so hospitals will, and, and you know, doctors will take it. It's got the lowest, uh, uh, you know, reimbursement rate. That it's lower than Medicaid, lower than Medicare, and, uh, you know, they don't, they're not. They don't want to take it. We have to. We have to fix it, and you don't fix it just by dumping money into it every now and then. Delegate Mike Pushkin is our guest. He is the state Democratic Party chairman. He's out of the 54th district, Kanawha County. He's also the minority chair of Health and Human Resources and Homeland Security, and minority vice chair of GovOrg. Matt Miller. Sounds like a very busy delegate. Uh, delegate Pushkin, tell us a little about that reimbursement through the PEIA. Who sets that reimbursement level? I, I, I believe that's set by you know by PEIA. Um, it's it's you know in order to it you know in order to raise it though you have to do one or two things you have to permanently fund it or do what nobody wants to do and that's raise premiums on the members. Or there's also a, the, the idea of looking at uh, who can be a member, uh, looking at families of members, and I think there's a hesitancy to do that. 
Uh, I think you know, none of these are, are easy fixes. But what what I've always supported, and what most of the Democrats have always, I think all the Democrats have supported, is designating a permanent funding stream. Uh, it, it's important. The state needs to make good on it. We need to take care of people who are working for the state and fund the other insurance program. Is there a particular stream that you could plug into supporting that PEIA, or is that going to be a revenue stream that really would need to be created in some way, which could mean additional taxes? Well, there's lots of different ones you could look at. In the past, we had talked about a slight raise to uh, severance tax on gas, and that would cover it. That, that's been one of the options we brought up in the past. That's not something that uh, tax that uh, that you or me are paying, but it's one that uh, the industry could afford to pay. So when you say a severance tax on gas, that's not something that we pay at the pump. That's at the the other end of no, 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 not on no, 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 right not on no, on the gas companies. Right, yeah, it's at, at the complete other end. Uh, let's go back yes. to DHHR, and you mentioned staffing shortages. Do you see some of those shortages going on there? Part of the flatline budget that has been going on for the last several years. I've heard those ideas out there that part of that flatline budget means we're not necessarily supporting things the way that we should. Yeah, that is that's part of the problem. And you know, the the governor and the Republican leadership in the legislature likes to pat themselves on the back over having these flat budgets, but then at the same time, uh, we're looking at all these shortages. I mean, just look at like child protective services. We can't get people to work there. We have over seven thousand children in in the system in foster care, and, and not enough not enough state workers to to take care of them, not enough state workers to look into these family situations and hopefully try to avoid the the removal before it happens. Uh, this should be a priority of ours, and it just hasn't been. And uh, you know, bragging about a flat budget and 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 deciding uh, you know which bad tax plan is better uh, uh, it doesn't mean anything when you got eight thousand children, over seven thousand children in the foster care system. Uh, if we can't take care of those that can't take care of themselves, what are we doing? Uh, we've got waiting lists for the uh, uh, the waiver program for for families with with uh, family members who have intellectual or developmental disabilities. Can't take care of them. What are we doing? Uh, so no, I, I don't think it's uh, uh, right for the governor and the Republicans and legislature to brag about a flat budget when we are failing. Uh, some of our most vulnerable citizens. Is it hard to find some of that staffing because of, uh, kind of like when we talked with Daly about teachers earlier in today's program, is it a matter of pay or is it a matter of some of the bureaucracy in the DHHR that that these staffers would have to go through that kind of has people looking at it going, I don't know if I really want to do that? Well, I think it's, it's mainly pay. I think that's the main thing. Mainly, what people are looking at when they're when they're looking into a career is that they're going to be able to for, to uh, provide for their families. A lot of these are tough jobs, especially if you're talking about working at CPS. It's a job you don't leave at work. A lot of the things that you deal with on a daily basis, you're going to take home with you. So, I think it's fair to uh, compensate these people, at least put them on par with with uh, public employees in other states. But yeah, there is also a lot of red tape. And uh, I have you know, some bills that actually uh, address that. And uh, over the years, we have worked on many bills that, that uh, remove some of the roadblocks to employment, uh, whether it's certain type of expungement laws or, or other um, other things that help people cut through the red tape and get, and get people back to work. <laughs> um, you know, speaking of which, um, you know, this state, we, what we haven't talked about is the, the drug problems in the state. It hasn't gone away. Um, it's something that – there are a lot of bills uh, coming down here that, that are going to actually I feel, make it harder uh, for our loved ones to get help. Um, that I see very troubling. I think people think that somehow we've defeated this drug problem. We haven't. It's worse than ever. And, and they're moving forward with bills that actually make it harder to get help. So it's just it's ridiculous to me where this uh, Republican legislature is placing its priorities this year. Uh, Mike, Jonathan Bodwell, um, we've gone a lot of different directions since we started talking. And I'm, I've got like a flow chart here. Um, you well, guys are you, you, you're gonna have to have me back on so we can uh, get to everything. But uh, go ahead. Well, as you always, guys, you're welcome, sir. Definitely. You, you guys are proposing 100 percent tax cut for people under 80 80 thousand families 80, under 80 thousand yes. families under 80 thousand yes. but on the other side you're talking about how we need to put more money into peia reimbursement rates we need to put more money into foster care we need to put more money into the waiver program if you had the choice 
and your party, which you are the, the chairman there, mm-hmm. what is, what's more important? You, you say there are all these things we need to fund, but on the other side, you say you want a 100% tax, tax cut. Which is more important? If you had your choice, would you prefer mm-hmm. to get all these things funded properly, thus take care of these 7,000-plus foster kids and the PEI reimbursement, PEIA reimbursement, all that, or would you prefer the 100% tax cut? Because both cannot happen. Well, I think both can happen if we if we have our priorities straight. I think if, if there's a Senate version of a tax cut, there's a governor's version of a tax cut, there's the House Republicans version of the tax cut. They're, they're all you know are dead set on having some sort of tax cut. Our position is if we're going to have a tax cut, let's make it meaningful for the people who really need it, and those are middle income earners. And if they say a tax cut is what brings people to West Virginia, what grows the tax base, what's what will help with some of these staffing shortages that will bring people here. I don't think a 15 percent tax cut that the Senate's proposing is going to bring people to West Virginia. I don't think the governor's 50 percent tax cut is. But I think if we make it meaningful and, and make it just for the for the the people that actually need it, and you know, a lot of that tax cut when you're talking about the what when you're doing the numbers, it's at the the top of the food chain. People who are making over eighty thousand dollars, when you give them a fifty percent tax tax cut, that's a big chunk of money. It's a lot less when you're talking about somebody that that's out here just you know working for a living, making less than eighty thousand dollars a year. What's the fiscal note on an eighty thousand dollar hundred percent tax cut, Mike? Um, it, I mean, it's, 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 it's fairly high, but I do think that's the type of tax cut we make up for by increasing our population. Do you know roughly how much it is? I think it's it about is? one and a half. I think it's about one and a half billion. One and a half billion. And what's our surplus? About one and a half billion. About one and a half billion. So that's not, I mean, based on the fact that we could end up on a cliff in a few years if things go wrong, that's probably not something we can do. The governor's tax plan uh, costs about the same about the same, except it benefits people in the top income brackets the most. Right, but but that is the one in fairness the ones that are getting a, more than four thousand dollars a year uh, in in uh, in tax breaks. I mean, that's the, the, if you're talking about fifty percent for people for millionaires, it's a lot of money. That's the that is the plan, though the governor's plan that Senator Tarr says fiscally the state cannot afford. As you look at the out years going uh, past, I think twenty twenty six. Regardless, to the next point, John. Um, if you had one thing you could get through this year, just one thing you'd like to see change, one thing you'd like to see better out of all these things we've talked about, what is the one thing you want, sir? Uh, it's hard to narrow it down to one thing. First of all, I think we really need to address um, our, our foster care crisis. I think we need to do a better job of addressing, and, and this goes hand in hand with it, of really looking in to the uh, drug epidemic that has just ravaged our state. We have a lot of bills that go the opposite way, make it harder to get help. I know I've got a a supplemental bill that I'll be coming out in the next few days if it's not already out, and that deals with American Rescue Plan funds. You know, we're in a very unique position where there's all this federal money that has come in because of COVID. I think the first part of it, the CARES Act, was misspent by the governor. There was no regulation over it. Instead, he did a, 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 you know, truck giveaway where he picked some of his favorite car dealers and bought some new trucks off of them to give away. I'm not sure if that was even legal. We'll know more about that soon. Some of the ARPA funds went into a water development fund that the governor took out of that fund to give Marshall a new ballpark. Look, we all love Marshall. We all love baseball. I don't think that was an appropriate way to spend American Rescue Plan funds and funneling it through a a water water development fund. I think the most important thing we can do is some real oversight on how the governor and how, how our government spends all this this influx of public funds that have come from from the Biden administration and, and the and the Democratic Congress over the past two years. So if, if if you look at Congress now, there's no way there's going to be any more of that coming. I don't think see anything getting done uh, in D.C. over the next two years. So we have to be very responsible with how we spend it. <laughs> the proposal that that I'm putting out, and I, I, we got this idea from a group here. Uh, in Kanawha County called the Tuesday Morning Group. It's also sponsored by the uh, West Virginia NAACP, is to put that money back down into local government based on the percentage of the population living below the poverty line in that county. And with a lot of oversight and how it's spent, but actually to address some of these root causes of these problems that have plagued this state, whether it's uh, drug addiction, um, all sorts of public health issues that, that we've had to put it into the areas of the greatest need based on the on the percentage of population under the poverty level 
and put that money where uh, where it could be used instead of letting the governor sit on it and use it as a, as an election slush fund. Because that's what's going to happen if we don't watch how that money is spent. The governor's use of the money, and in fact, the whole process of this, the money that was sent to Marshall University to finish the baseball stadium, leaves me confused. And I'll, I'll tell you why. In the early days of the pandemic, you might remember the governor was criticized for having funds that he sat on for a long time and didn't release back when we needed these funds released to local communities because they were afraid of the clawback provisions. So that money for the longest time was just sitting there while local communities Mm -hmm. figured out ways to pay for things. Now at the end, I'm told that the governor was made aware of a deadline where if they didn't hurry up and do something with this money, they were going to have to give it back. And then all of a sudden, quickly... Next thing you know, Marshall gets 10 or $13 million, depending on who I talked to that day, for a baseball stadium. So I'm a little confused if at first we were so concerned when we needed this money badly in our communities that we wouldn't release it because we weren't sure of the guidelines. How at the end were we so sure it was okay to build a baseball stadium out of this? Well, I'm, I don't think it was okay to build a baseball stadium out of it. It was funneled. The money was, was funneled through a, an infrastructure fund that was created by the legislature. I think there, the legislature needs to – we need to do our job of having tighter oversight on, on how the governor chooses to spend this money, especially, especially when he is you know, weighing the, the, the possibility of running for another statewide office. Uh, I hate to say it, but the way he's got control of that kind of money, we've seen it done like this in the past where there's uh, you know, you know, ribbon cuttings all over the place that, uh, in, in, that look a lot like campaign events. Um, that money could best be spent by our local governments. They know where the problems are. That's why I've put forth in, or in, I'm introduced a supplemental appropriation bill to take a large part of that American Rescue Plan money, money that was sent to us. Uh, thank you, uh, you know, Senator Manchin and President Biden. Uh, that money that was sent to us to help people who were struggling and really address some of the uh, the communities that were most affected uh, by the pandemic. That's what the money was spent for. My proposal. Uh, the proposal from the NAACP and the Tuesday Morning Group, it follows the letter of the law. It follows the spirit of the law. I don't believe it's the spirit of the law to build baseball stadiums with federal relief money. Didn't the first money come from the Trump administration? Yeah, that was the CARES Act, and that's the money he used on the uh, the baby dog sweepstakes. Yeah, and I just want to give everybody credit, no, that's all, not just the no, Biden administration. There was, no, oh, there was no oversight over that money. We had the legislature had to come back in and put a cap on what the governor could spend uh, during a, a, an emergency. We had to put a cap on it at $150 million. Uh, a lot of us signed a petition to call ourselves back in. In fact, the, the majority of the House signed a petition to call ourselves back in, if you remember, during that time, uh, to put a cap to limit what the governor was able to spend without any kind of oversight. And our, our Republican counterparts in the Senate uh, refused to sign that. And that's when Senator Carmichael was still Senate president. He, they refused to sign that petition to call ourselves back in uh, to limit what the governor could spend. I think it was a huge mistake, and that's why you had a, a really, I feel, was a misappropriation of federal relief funds. And a lot of that went to local car dealers. Mike Pushkin, thank, thank you very much for your time. I know you've got a meeting to get to. I appreciate your availability. I'm out of Democrats up here in the Eastern Panhandle, so I got to go in search of when it comes to getting a Democratic politician. <laughs> well, we're going to try to we're going to try to correct that problem here uh, in the next few years. Thank you, Michael. Some more Democrats to talk. Thanks. To. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Have a great day.